Um, thank you so much. I hugely appreciate that you're here in what is one of the prime gardening weekends in the British calendar, uh, the centenary weekend for Gardens Open in London, incidentally. Uh, there's an absolute parallel range on offer. Um, I did ask one of you what time is the AGM, and very sweetly he said three o'clock. <laughs> I tend to speak for about 55 minutes, and I'm in the backwash from the amazing Bacchanals of Oxford, whose um, last night of the term was last night, um, and I didn't really get to bed until today. Um, I put on the screen before we start for 55 minutes. Uh, two images, reasonably recent. I'm very fond of the one on the left. This is a seal stone of Alexander with a slightly multicultural look, wearing the ransom of Amen. And here um, is, if I, there is an inscription in Karoshti, uh, wonderful, from northwest India, um, dating certainly before 280 BC. On the right, what looked more plausible in its first manifestation, um, a uh, recent seal stone found in. Israel um, from Tel Dor and claimed to be Alexander himself. Right. Uh, I offered one or two titles for a talk and was told by your revered President Neno the word Alexander has to be in it. I'm more than aware that a certain amount is familiar, they're highly, always highly disputed, but there are, I promise you, one or two things that even this audience may have missed. <laughs> right, it's 25 2, so off we go. Five years after Alexander's death in 318 BC, the commanders of his Macedonian infantry, history's toughest men, believe me, were persuaded by the former secretary Eumenes to meet in the presence of his arms, his scepter, and his royal diadem placed on his former throne of gold and to deliberate as if in his presence. On a specially contrived hearth and fire, they would offer precious incense, frankincense included, and then pay obeisance, proskinesis, to Alexander as a god, Hose Theon. The source underlying Diodorus here is the hard-headed Hieronymus, who was present with Eumenes at the time, perhaps an eyewitness in the very tent. In his lifetime, Alexander had tried but failed to introduce proskinesis as a human social custom on the established Persian model, but after his death, his veteran officers are paying it to him in the Greek tradition as an honor for a god. The fire, the altar, the proskinesis, the incense are all Greek elements, not, as has recently been claimed, some multicultural construction by Eumenes, a pest from the Chersonis, uh, for Macedonian and Iranian worship together. It's all highly revealing. Greeks, it has been claimed, never appealed to the protection of a deceased Hellenistic ruler, except for the Ptolemaic queen Arsinoe, who was seen as the protectress of seafarers. But Alexander is the crushing counterexample. The tent ceremony travelled on with Eumenes' army until his death in winter 3176 and drew in ever more of the hardened Macedonian officers. Alexander had merely, I quote, departed from among men as the edict of Polyperchon discreetly stated to the Greek cities in 319-8. In recent studies of early Hellenistic period, divine honours tend to be related to civic contexts, discussed in terms of negotiations, strategies even, and why not the social memory of our Greek polis. But for two years, honours to Alexander were not being paid by a polis at all, they were being offered by an uneasy amalgam of Macedonian commanders, some of them old enough to have served with old Philip II. They were certainly not just engaged in mindless cult acts of scholarship in the 50s to 1980s. They had beliefs, of course, beliefs which turn bodily movements, as philosophers always say, into actions, actions which we can perfectly well understand without any risk of their demon Christianizing assumptions. One such belief, as Hieronymus makes quite plain, was that Alexander was indeed divine, a god, and, I quote, was leading them on. After Alexander, divine honors for living mortals become a familiar part of the Hellenistic scene and persist for 700 years. They survived because they functioned. Why? <laughs> 
in the past 10 years, public scholarship has returned to the practice and the mentalities involved. In his recent Cornell lectures on Greek religion, Robert Parker has listed seven points which could be regarded as a sort of scholarly acquis on the subject. I wish to relate the main points this afternoon to Alexander and, more briefly, his early successors. Testing the macro against, I assure you, the micro, at points where, quite separately, scholarship on Alexander and on the early successors has been moving in a rather different direction. I will touch on four still controversial areas. Precedence, if any, for divine honours for a living man, the claim to be the son of a god, evidence for actual cult of Alexander in his lifetime, and then the cults of the first successors, whether or not they're true to Alexander's example. Wherever possible, I will bring in recently found or long overlooked evidence. Some of it refutes previous articles, other bits of it make them out of date. Precedence. A century ago, the tendency was to respect our precedents and cite Pindar's advice. Do not seek to become Zeus. To explain the divine cult of Alexander as something caught like an evil virus from conquests in Asia, from the despotic East. Of course, that view has faded. And despite Professor Badian's selective efforts to remove them in 1981, Greek precedents cannot now be argued away. Even as Pindar wrote, some spectacular athletes were receiving cult. The thrice victorious Olympic boxer, Euthymus of Locri, was receiving cult sacrifices for exploits in his lifetime. And another boxer, Theagenes of Thassos, who once beat him, enjoyed godlike honours, of course, too. And in the 5th century, so too, it seems, did Euthycles, also, interestingly, of Locri. Our athletic fans, I regret to say, are capable of extraordinary extravagance. <laughs> Politically, the first crucial case is, we know, Lysander, a Spartan. On Samos, that festival for Lysander, the Lysandrea, is epigraphically attested. Badium tried to explain it away as a posthumous honour. Interestingly, the attempt doesn't work. Within a year of Lysander's death in 395, Samos had certainly aligned itself with Athens and with Conon's liberation in the Aegean. In late 391, it was then forced briefly back into a Spartan alignment, but rapidly it returned to an Athenian one, thankfully, in 390. Now, the inscription shows that the Lysandria was celebrated at least four times. There is no room for four annual celebrations in Samos's brief Spartan-aligned interval after Lysander's death. Rather, as Communis Opinio accepted, the festival was introduced in Lysander's lifetime by that loathsome decarchy which he imposed on the island in 404. They were indeed a narrow local fan club. Such a fan festival would never have survived their decarchy's end, let alone been introduced again afterwards. Samians hated him. The Greek 4th century is distinguished for named individual rulers. It is not, though, some new century of the individual. Among them, Clearchus, tyrant ruler of Heraclea, is said to have identified himself with attributes of Zeus. There may, however, be some overstated slander here in what are ultimately local Hellenistic sources preserved by Trogus and Justin. In Sicily, however, there is more interesting evidence. Plutarch and Diodorus both describe superhuman honours, to keep it vague for the moment, for Syracuse's liberator, no less than Dion, in 357. Brian Bosworth has recently urged that we give priority to Diodorus, who refers only to heroic honours instituted by the city. In Plutarch, however, as Dion enters, the crowds who are lining the streets are said to have turned to him with prayer, as if a spur to a god. And according to Bosworth, they were doing so, I quote, only in the heat, heat of a passing moment. But even so, they did it. And if we read Plutarch more thoroughly, they did rather more in an elaborate style. 
They had brought sacrificial victims, Plutarch says, tables, craters with them. But when Dion came past, they pelted him, ballet, with prochytai, not, despite our modern lexica, in this one instance meaning flowers, but surely drops of wine flicked at him from their bells, like my undergraduates. <laughs> Plutarch here is using the contemporary Timonides, an eyewitness. And although Timonides favoured Dion, he cannot simply be discarded. There were then godlike honours with a certain amount of planning first, and perhaps they bedded down later into a hero cult only, instituted by a civic decree. But if so, I do note divine and then heroic honours were being offered to one and the same person, blurring a line which is otherwise claimed by scholars to have been maintained clearly until after Alexander. And I also wonder though if Diodorus, relying on Ephorus, Timaeus here, is really to be trusted for his loose word, perhaps heroic honours. The important advances directly relevant to Alexander are those in Macedon. Trust in a scolias on the first Olynthiac and in Elias Aristides should never come easily to modern historians of the fourth century. <laughs> but it is there notoriously that we are told of an Amintion, a shrine, surely, for Philip's father, Amintas III, in Pydna, and also of cult for Philip himself at Amphipolis. Both texts draw on the same underlying source, one highly hostile to Philip from what they go on to say, I've argued, ultimately, Theopompus. And the scoliast, I stress, has not inferred the existence of something called Amintheon from anything in Demosthenes' text. Now, at Pydna, recently, numismatists have argued from the city's coin types for a refoundation of the city precisely in the mid-370s, a dating acceptable to the site's modern archaeologists, slap in the reign of Amintas III. Just the right context for divine honours, founder and royal benefactor. At Amphipolis, our same two dodgy sources allege similar honours for his son, King Philip, while the city is apparently still independent, and I've argued that they might fit as early as 358. Philip then removed a garrison the Athenians had left in the city and declared it autonomous. Not, of course, for long. That dating might seem much too early in his reign, but there is now evidence nearby. Among a range of inscriptions from cities in the Chalcidiki and nearby, recently discussed with care by Manuela Mari, some of them refer to Philip in terms involving cult. As she warns, they are mostly undateable. Philip II, or is it Philip V, as I tend to think often? But one notoriously stands out, the late 4th century inscription of Philippi, which refers clearly to an existing temenos of Philip among temene for the other Greek gods. The word temenos must refer at this date to, let's say, land for the cult of a god. Philip, therefore, was being worshipped with divine honours in his new city foundation, Philippi, Philippi. Divine honours, don't think a hero would have a temenos. The probability is that they had existed since 356, when the city was founded. Now, cults for a living king in Macedon's outlying cities or their royal foundations are quite one thing. Actual cults at court, or in a further away independent Greek city, would be quite another. As we know, in 336, newly liberated Erosos opted only for a cult of Zeus Philippios, Zeus with a special interest in Philip. I do not for one moment believe that by 336 there was an actual cult of Philip already flourishing at Kynosages in Athens, as stated by Clement of Alexandria, not even as a joke at his expense, or even a rather Dutch sort of joke, defended as it was ably by Henk Verstel. The more important bits of evidence come all from 336, mainly linked to the last Olympic Games to be celebrated when Philip prepared to go to Asia and to that massive palace, the Great Gain, from its recent archaeological re-examination, Philip's Palace at Ege Vergina. By 336, in the heart of Olympia's sanctuary, there was a big Philippium, 
It may not have had an outdoor altar for offerings to the people represented inside. So much is discussed, the arrangement of the sacred statues, the composite materials used, but the central statue, Shirley Phillips, from the beginning, is placed, if you look on it carefully, so that the sight line runs directly to the Temple of Olympian Zeus and Phidias's wondrous statue of Zeus. Not cult, but at least Zeus Philippios. And at Ephesus in 336, an image, Icon of Philip, was also to be seen in the city's Artemis temple. And it too need not have received public cult. But then above all, at Aege in autumn, not summer 336, in Macedon, Philip's statue was processed into the theatre with statues of the twelve Olympian gods. Now, cults of the twelve gods are well known already, for instance, at Athens. And according to Diodorus, Philip is presenting himself here as Synthronos with the gods and as a thirteenth. In later inscribed Greek texts, for instance, texts for Antinous in Egypt, the person who is called Synthronos is clearly being worshipped as a god. However, in 336, up at Ege, no text or plaque stated this for the onlookers. They might only have understood the procession as a sign that Philip was enjoying the favourable company of the twelve gods. If I can break into Latin for the Hellenic Society, comitatu deorum valatus, uh, all around with the company of the gods. As one of our last pagans, a correspondent of Augustine, so beautifully expresses his pagan sense of divine companionship. Whatever it was, this divine-like honour, godlike honour, was not being offered to Philip as a strategy of negotiation voluntarily by his subjects. It was his own order, personally imposed, part of a carefully planned wedding celebration. He was wishing, Diodorus reminds us, to be, I quote, thought well of by the Greeks, not to appall them. Only in the Suida's entry on Antipater is Antipater said, independently, to have considered the cult of a mortal man to be Asabes. But I remain sceptical, highly, of this very late and random comment. It certainly didn't apply to posthumous honours for a Macedonian king, as we also see from Philip's cremation and entombment at Ege. We know that a small shrine, since 1977 discovered, was built in close relation to his, I mean his, tomb to his indeed it is now. And it has conventionally been called a heroon, but as Andronikos agreed, nothing in it excludes, not even a dodgy reference in the Alexander Romance, a possibility of being a small shrine for full divine honours. In 1996, Professor Badian returned to this procession with Philip's statue and argued that it had a specific and unrecognised context. Philip, he claims, was deliberately promoting his status as godlike, as an Esothios foes, in his final months, in order to match in advance the divine status of the Persian king whose realm he was about to invade. Well, a random explanation. Esothios did not mean Theos, it is true. And yet, in Aeschylus' Percy of 472, duly cited by Badian, both terms, Theos and Esotheos, are applied to the Persian king. Since 472, however, Greek knowledge about the king's status in Persia had somewhat moved on. Philip had entertained noble Persians of Pella since the late 350s, Artabazus and his family, including beautiful bilingual Barsini, who was later to be Alexander's concubine, the older woman, the Persian king was not the recipient of divine cult, as they would surely have told Philip, and certainly other Greeks well knew. In a striking passage, in the 340s, in the army of King Artaxerxes, the champion Greek warrior Nicostratus of Argos is described by Theopompus as setting aside every day a table of food and dedicating it to the daimon of the Persian king. Theopompus alleges that he'd heard, Nicostratus had heard, that Persian attendants at the door of the king did exactly the same. This daimon, I presume, is a Greek interpretation of that symbol, surely of Ahura Mazda, that winged abstraction 
which we know so well both from Persian royal art and the opening scene of Oliver Stone's film. Did it make the king into an East Sophios foes? At best, in the 5th century and later, the king could be called the image of a god, icon theo, as Plutarch's Themistocles actually says, a phrase which is prominent, incidentally, in the self-presentation of semi-Iranian Antiochus of Comagene. But he was not a theos, nor really, in any strong sense, was he Isothios. But as we've seen, Philip had been receiving godlike honours long before 336 at Philippi, even, I suspect, Amphipolis. His association of himself at Aegea as the 13th god, or a 13th among 12 gods, grew out of this Greek pattern, surely, not out of some view, mistaken, of what as a king in Asia he would need to be. In the orbit of Macedon, therefore, a spectrum of godlike honours for a living ruler did have precedence before Alexander's reign. In the wider Greek world, divine honours for a living man had precedence too. And they fit well with the current scholarly Aki. They relate to patterns of cult for traditional gods, they fit into the king's roles as agents of benefaction. Incidentally, that actual phrase, isothioi praxis, has now indeed turned up in a Greek inscription um, recording the honours of the demos at Claros for Octavian, probably in 30 to 29. As for Philip's icon Ephesus, it was not the only honorific image of the mid 330s to be inserted into an existing temple. We must remember, at Thespi, Praxiteles' statue of the beautiful Phryne, the top Greek hetaira, had also been inserted into an existing sanctuary between statues of Eros and Aphrodite. So much of the scholarly Aki is rather male. It emphasizes male deeds and male benefactions as the driving force. As Praxiteles is said to have been Phryne's lover, a rather widely bestowed benefaction, perhaps the benefaction model could apply to her honours at Thespi too. But they surely honoured a godlike quality as well, divine beauty seen in Phryne, as it is seen in the later heroines of those Greek novels who are hailed as goddesses by onlookers simply because they look so lovely. There was also the tradition, widely known, whether true or not, that Phryne had actually posed as Praxiteles' model for sculptures of Aphrodite. Certainly, I think later, Phryne would have been revered as Phryne Aphrodite. The age of Alexander sees new cults for a living man made prominent, but as we shall see, there's also a prominence for cults of exceptional women. Now, divine sonship. By 331, Alexander wished to be known as the begotten son of Zeus. We can see that certainly from the shredded remains of the retained historian Callisthenes is not in dispute. With characteristic robustness, George Corkwell recently wrote, I quote, Alexander pronounced himself son of Ammon. Explanation is neither possible nor necessary. <laughs> Let us explore it further, not least in the light of some highly unexpected evidence. Divine sonship, we know, is a quality of some of famous heroes. It then becomes the staff of Greek panegyric, as we'll see. The only compelling primary source, we must remember, as for the virginity of Mary, must be female, the mother, like Mary, concerned. All the while, there was that parallel non-Greek tradition alive in Egypt for the pharaoh, the begotten son of the god Amun-Ra. Alexander's Homeric engagement is too well known to need discussion, and so too mythical descent from the gods was very widely claimed. I can't resist pointing out it even applied to animals. At Argos in the fourth century, we are told there were horses linearly descended from the king Thracian diamond Thracian king Diomedes man-eating horses. So Diodorus IV tells us, until the time of Alexander. Were they given to Alexander, the Argive, Argiad king of Macedon, as a gift of equine singanea? As for actual sonship of a god, Isocrates revealingly disclaims any wish to enlarge on it for Nicocles, the Cypriot prince, because the claim, he tells us, is just the currency nowadays. <coughs> 
for poets and orators. What about mothers? Well, in the 6th century BC, the mother of Spartan Demaratus insisted that he had been fathered by that mysterious hero who visited her bed shortly before her own husband returned from partying and did the same. This emphatic assertion of her son's divine parentage was her answer to critics of his legitimacy. The assertion, incidentally, was surely known to Herodotus because he'd heard it, like so much else about Spartan kingship, from Demaratus' family living in regrettable exile on that Persian estate in Asia Minor. Fans of athletes were as extravagant as always. Diagoras of Rhodes was called begotten son of Hermes. Theagenes of Thassos, who did once outbox the great Euphymus in 480, was considered, I quote, begotten son of Heracles by the Thasians. Back in Locri, Euthymus was praised, but only as son of a local river god. In the fourth century, Clearchus, again from unspecified sources, regarded himself as the son of Zeus. There is a background. But much more solidly, Syracuse's Dionysius II left us a remarkable line of verse, referring to himself as a begotten son of Apollo from Apollo's koinomase with his mother, Doris. It's quoted verbatim by Plutarch. And according to Spusippus, Plato's successor, Plato too was, I quote, straight up front, the begotten child of Apollo. It's less often realised that Alexander's famous court prophet, Aristander, actually wrote a book on the subject, fragments of which survive for us. We owe, though it's neglected, to Origen writing against Celsus, the knowledge that Aristander too referred to Plato's divine fa fathering by Apollo, who appeared to his mother as a phasma. So we can be sure tales of the divine parentage of recent mortals were to be heard in the evening from Alexander's restrained expert on religious mumbo-jumbo. As for his mother Olympias, to cheer you up, as for his mother Olympias, snake on the left, she put down my trousers, <laughs> she was said, according to the otherwise sceptical Eratosthenes, to have sent Alexander on his way to Asia, urging him to act worthily of his genesis, his begetting. Eratosthenes was sceptical of Alexander's divinity, but evidently he believed that at least Olympias had told such tales. And so too, Demosthenes, after visiting Pella, promptly referred to Alexander as the young Margites, a riposte, I once suggested, to the young Alexander's known Homeric pretensions as Achilles, but also, we must remember, Margites is notorious as a non-hero, an idiot who didn't even really know who his real parents were. Was Demosthenes already making fun of rumours about young Alexander's disputed fathering before 336. Like Demaratus the king and Dionysius II, Alexander was in a royal setting in which his claims to be an heir and successor were being contested. Now, in Egypt, of course, his personal suspicion, which I accept, of a possible divine sonship burst out into public assertion and widespread publicity. As Wilken decisively showed in the 1920s, but Brunt unwisely brushed over in the 1970s, the theme of Alexander's divine sonship of Zeus was publicised not because of the content of any oracle at Siwa. Alexander never revealed such contents, but only because of the public greeting of Alexander by the priest of Ammon at the shrine as son of Zeus. Presumably the priest had heard he was the new ruler of Egypt, and greeted him on the temple steps in front of the press corps, including Callisthenes, with words reflecting his status as the begotten son of, to the Greeks, the god Zeus. On return to Memphis, this is the claim which is publicised far and wide. There was time, I also consider, for both Miletus and Erythri to mobilise their local oracles and to send messages hailing Alexander, son of Zeus, and for them to reach him in Egypt in spring 331. Well, on such long debated topics, nothing new, you may agree with Corkwell, can possibly be added. How amazingly wrong we all are. The magnificent researches of the young Catalan scholar, Francisco Bosque 
Puhe in the Cairo Museum helped, he has explained to me, surreptitiously by its Nubian curator, her brilliant rig recovered an inscribed stone, Francisco has kindly sent the pictures, um, yellowish in colour and over a metre high, probably a pedestal for a dedication where the ruler sits on its top, now lost. In 1938, this stone was discovered in the Baharia oasis to the east of Siwa, the next oasis to the east, and was made known to the great Ahmed Fakhri during the excavation of a small temple in the Baharia oasis at Tasril Megizbah. And the temple was found to be dedicated to the god Amun, as it also on a wall commemorated Alexander with pharaonic titles. It was clearly dedicated during Alexander's reign. Those texts are never posthumous. The inscribed stone was never published, was never seen. Yet, little did we know, it had survived meanwhile intact in the basement in Cairo to be found and studied at last by Bosque Pouhet and his Nubian abetter with due care in 2008. On the front face, it has two columns of hieroglyphics. And the left one commemorates Alexander. What's important? First, for the first time in all our evidence, it gives him all five pharaonic titles, the whole lot, the full Monty. Refuting Wilkins' considered view, Alexander only ever received three. And importantly, the whole lot, or indeed almost any title, are never found for any king during the preceding Persian decade in Egypt since their reconquests in 343 to 2. As in other respects, Alexander was being honoured wildly by the Egyptians far more than any recent Achaemenid predecessor, despite Priya Brion in Egypt. Even more interestingly, the Egyptian text includes in the sort of cartouche space for Alexander, the signs meaning son of Amun, besides quite separately stating the conventional status as, I quote, beloved of Amun-Ra, chosen of Amun, beloved of Amun-Ra. This singular inclusion in the cartouche of the ruler's own name of extra words is highly unusual. Os Pouquet has established and explained to me there may only be one precedent in the entire range of Egyptology. The column to the right, incidentally, commemorates the dedicator of the monument, one Hor Hetep, explaining he's the first prophet of Amen Ra, first in the sense of the top one. But above all, on the left side of the stone, with hands trembling, Francisco, writing his d fill realised, photographed and published an unnoticed but entirely clear, I promise you, <laughs> Greek inscription photographed without any light in the uh, basement of the museum. I'll make it clear in a minute. And what does it say? God bless it. Basilius, Alexandros, Amoni, Patrick. The Amicron is restored, but it's obvious. The temple did continue in use into the Roman period, but my and Bos Pouquet's careful comparison of the inscription's Greek letter forms, and indeed the style of them, and their spacing with 4th century certain Greek inscriptions to Siwa, shows they're quite consistent with an early date for the inscription. Definitely, it is not lettering of Roman date, as Legolas Pie and so on. There are, of course, clear possibilities. The hieroglyphs in Alexander's honour were inscribed in his reign by Hor-Hetep, and perhaps someone later added a Greek text explaining that a dedication to Father Amen, Father N.B., has been made by King Alexander himself. But much more economically, perhaps the temple was dedicated in Alexander's name, which is true, because he himself, no surprise, went to it and he passed through the oasis in 332 to 1. Other options occurring to your sceptical mind can be excluded at once. The Greek text is certainly not, that's uh, the style of the Egyptian one, that's where the, the Greek one sits. This is what we want. That is uh, uh, Francisco's transcription. That's the Jews, Alexandros, and many to Patri. Uh, don't tell me the S's and P's in that have anything to do with the Roman period. It is not a graffito by a late hand. 
The text words and the lines are very carefully spaced and what I would stress is this yellow granite is extremely hard. To cut a letter into it is not at all easy. The text is only the work of a practiced, careful mason, not somebody thinking it would be fun to write on the walls of the metro. The hieroglyphic text on the front has to belong in Alexander's reign before 323 because these sort of texts for rulers are never posthumous. Uh, it's believed actually to repeat the hieroglyphic text from the temple's back wall, which was copied not very well by Fakhri in 1938, but sadly no longer visible on site. Well, the full five, five hieroglyphic titles, to keep off the Greek for the moment, don't prove that Alexander had had an actual Egyptian coronation ceremony, much disputed, in, say, Memphis before going west. They are found, for instance, in texts for the idiotic Philip III, who never even went to Egypt. But the text's particular insistence in hieroglyphics on Alexander, son of Amun, almost all with hyphens, is striking. NB, Amun, Amun Ammon of Siwa, it must be emphasized, not the generalized Amun-Ra of pharaonic themes. In his lifetime, the prophet Horhetep, in this amazingly remote Bahari oasis, knew very well what's often been disputed, that Alexander had a very special relationship to Siwa's god. But more, I think, should be inferred. The Greek text implies actual dedication by Alexander to his father, and an item Perhaps a sacred boat may have stood on the top of the pedestal where Francesco confirms there is indeed an indentation. It's exceptional in the 4th century for any Egyptian text to be combined with a Greek text on behalf of a ruler on one and the same stone. So I suggest, on visiting the Oasis 332 to 1, Alexander himself did make a dedication at the site immediately to Father Amen in a sanctuary which was then built up or adorned more in his lifetime and became the little temple of Amun we now see with hieroglyphs in his honour. Inside the temple, the pedestal held or commemorated Alexander's own dedication in Egyptian and then with a Greek text carefully cut and arranged with permission for Greek visitors and the text were inscribed in his lifetime. Now, I say Alexander visited advisedly. The Bahari Oasis lies on a visible, viable route across the desert from Siwa to Memphis, straight across, famously. A route different to Alexander's approach down to Siwa, the one from the coast and via Paritonion. Uh, notoriously, it's Ptolemy who states, contrary to Aristobulus, who was perhaps absent, that Alexander did return to Memphis, I quote, by another route. Well, my interpretation, the Baharia dedication, proves Ptolemy, as I would expect, to be right. Within days of the Siwa visit, it means Alexander himself arrived on the way home, honoured Siwa's Amen as his father, in the very first sanctuary to Amen, which he had met on his way back from the Siwa oracle. It's correct, I think, that he's called King Alexander. Disputed. At Priene, he is indeed called King Alexander in the dedicatory inscription on the Athena temple. However, in the most recent study in the last two years, that inscription is now considered by the archaeologists there to be later than Alexander's visit in 334, probably later even than 331. However, in my view, he was indeed styled explicitly King Alexander in the original communication that he sent to Erosos in 332-1, to just before going to Siwa. Although, as Anari No. 7 has excellently shown recently, the text was probably not fully inscribed until 305. It is a minefield. On any view, it is now untrue that Macedonian kings were not called Basius officially until after Gorgomila. Philip was already Basilius Philippos, as roof tiles found from buildings on his foundation of Heraclea at Florina in Upper Macedon have now established. For the Greek public, Kodosides explained Amon as Zeus. But Alexander's mutinous troops in 324 and the hostile pamphleteer Ephippus used the actual A word. 
and indeed, as Nearchus tells us, Alexander himself talked of Ammon of the Libyans, Zeus of the Greeks. On descending the river Indus, according to Arian, he honoured, I quote, Heracles his propator, Ammon, and the other gods. Ammon, I suggested, was singled out there as Alexander's pater. The Baharia inscription makes that even easier to believe. According to Plutarch, Alexander used to say that Zeus was the father of all men. Homer, after all, had said as much, but that he made the best, particularly his own. That reported opinion catches Alexander's special relationship to the god very well. Now, third part. Sonship of Zeus, or Amen, is not the same as receiving actual godlike honours. But here, recent scholars of Alexander and his successors still are determined, wrongly I wish to argue, to attribute the initiative to pressure directly from Alexander himself. For Badian, Alexander after Gorgamila was, I quote, between two thrones and heaven. He wanted to, to attain the godlike status of an Aesopheos foes. The status, Badian believes, of a Persian king, but also the status which Philip, at least in Badian's view, had been trying to claim in 336. His Alexander is haunted by this wish. And for Badian, the attempt to introduce proskinesis in 327 was an attempt to be just this, Aesopheos foes. For Bosworth too, in his Arian commentary, it's Alexander's attempt to impose worship of himself. But it was nothing of the sort as the one eyewitness account by Cares, the butler, the master of ceremonies, used by Plutarch and Arian makes play. After paying priest proskinesis, each courtier was to come up to Alexander and be kissed on the lips as an equal. The procedure was based on social gradations of greeting between superiors and equals, and Persia, as Herodotus had observed. But the crucial point, gods, do not systematically kiss each of their worshippers. Alexander is not presenting himself to his select invited group of guinea pigs as a god at all. The so-called debate on divinity with which Alexander begins the account of proskinesis is, as Bickerman well argued, and we shouldn't have forgotten, a Hellenistic fiction. Arian, I think, drew on it because the main sources, Ptolemy and Aristobulus, had nothing to help him. They had left the entire experiment out. It had been such an embarrassing social failure and a trigger, surely, for the page's plot. However, on returning from India, Alexander received, or at least was addressed in, an open letter, no less, from Theopompus, bits of which survive in Athenaeus and have fascinated me for nearly 45 years. In it, Theopompus, we read, tells Alexander how at Babylon his treasurer Harpalus has honoured his recently dead mistress, the Athenian supertar Pythionike, as Pythionike Aphrodite. He'd even given her a shrine and a temenos, and what's more, an altar. At the time of Theopompus' writing, Harpalus was still at Tarsus. He'd gone there, I would argue, so to be near the great treasure centre at Kyinda, which should be located, incidentally, on the nearby rock fortress, the later Anazabas. The letter from Theopompus thus belongs before Harpalus's flight to Athens, or before summer 324. It certainly belongs before any exile's decree was ever sent by Alexander to Greece. And it also belongs before Alexander is really within easy reach of news and facts in Babylon. To him, Theopompus cites those in Babylon as informants were telling him, therefore, things which Alexander is assumed not yet to know. A date of 325 would fit this well. But crucially, by these divine honours for a tart, Theopompus tells Alexander, Harpalus trampled on propylacacy yours. Theopompus certainly implies before 324 that Alexander therefore is worthy of such divine honours. At least half of Theopompus says so. But he also surely implies that these are honours that are already being paid to Alexander and that Harpalus is disgracing an existing fact 
by this shocking initiative. And for Alexander's honours to rank with Pythionikis, they'd have to be full-blown divine honours. She was Pythionike Aphrodite, and he would have to be then being honoured somewhere, known to Theopompus as Alexander's Zeus, already, before any decree and any demand, any return to the Greek world. Now, for Ephesus, Apelles painted Alexander with a thunderbolt. The image was put in the Temple of Artemis, probably before 325, though a clear date isn't certain. The so-called porous medallions, I have argued, were struck as actual coins at Susa, precisely in 325. Already they show Alexander partly in military dress, but holding a thunderbolt. Neither image need be interpreted wholeheartedly as Alexander was Alexander's use, but they're at least consistent with that sort of atmosphere. So is the recently emerged enigmatic gold coin from that capacious Hellenistic well of near Zakar, near Peshaw, famous item, um, still regarded by French numismatists after repeated colloquia as genuine, though almost everyone else sits on the fence. It shows Alexander wearing the aegis of Zeus around his neck. Is it a spade? Is it a one-off? Is it a fake? I don't know. We wait for the next publication in French. And wearing the horn of Amen, and may perfectly well date from 325 to 4. The important point, so often missed since, is that Theopompus was writing before the time when any supposed deification decree from Alexander that supposedly been issued to the horror of the Greek cities. When he returned back from India into the Greeks' awareness, such a supposed decree from on high, I would argue, was not even needed. Why, in 334, cities of Ionia had been freed. They'd been given democracies, released as never before at the same time from tribute. I can readily imagine local civic cults in some of the cities for Alexander at that point, or well, certainly after autumn 331 and the crushing news of Gorgamila. Alexander had appeared before them once, in a swirl of youth and beauty, astride Bucephalus, and had benefited their cities uniquely. Had Zeus ever really done so much? Now, for Badin, nonetheless, Alexander was still seeking supposed legitimation as an Isotheos foes in 325, so, I quote, that he could impose proskynesis and his own worship on Greeks and Macedonians. Contrary to Baden's amazing theory, there was no evidence whatsoever that Alexander had been hoping on his return to stage a sort of legitimation ceremony to that end behind King Tessaurus's tomb, let alone that the Magi there had frustrated it by breaking the royal insignia. Nor, when unable to hold this unattested ceremony, did Alexander then go further and actually demand divine status from all the Greeks. In summer 322, I remind you significantly, the Athenian orator Hyperides knew of no such deification decree. Ideal they would have been for bitter mention in his anti-Macedonian funeral speech, that, I quote, swan song of Greek freedom. Recent careful re-examination of the speeches papyrus in London has not changed the crucial point first observed by Bickerman in 1967. The orator in 322, a year after Alexander's death, contrasts the Athenians' compulsion, we are compelled in the present tense, to watch Ephorain on the one hand, cult being paid to a living man. Watch it, that is, outside our own city of Athens, but also to honour his lackeys, his oikotai, as heroes, we ourselves being compelled to give those honours, so the sentence ends decisively. There's no uncertainty in the papyrus' reading. The orator is saying nothing of a decree or a demand from Alexander for his own worship, although such a decree would have suited his speech excellently. He didn't mention one because none had existed. The compelling order rather had been to honour people like Hephaestio, recently validated as a hero by an oracle sought by Alexander from Amon. And indeed, Hephaestio was honoured as such in Greece as that excellent votive relief of Diogenes, my fellow Macedonian cavalryman, recently found at Pella, has now exemplified. It is dedicated by Diogenes with an inscription 
to Hephaestia and Nehera. In the Athenian assembly, of course, divine honours for Alexander has certainly been debated between autumn 324 and spring 323. But the speakers are not grappling with some awkward cognitive problem, as if trying to represent to themselves, or even to the late great Dr. Simon Price, the puzzle of power I quote on the perplexing new scale of Alexander. Orators and audience knew exactly what they were trying to do, to save their lands on Samos. And as they said, they would do if they had to, whatever it took. Demides even proposed cult, Alexander should be a 13th god. But as Alexander died, the proposal was never enacted, and after the god's death, Demides was prosecuted at once for an illegal proposal. Once again, no decree from Alexander in tradition, anecdote, or fragmentary speech is mentioned telling these orators that they have to propose a cult of himself. It's all canny flattery, a means to an end, to save Samuel Earth, while not arguing about heaven. So, worship of the living Alexander belongs neatly with the new Aki among scholars on ruler cult. It was always offered by cities from below, flattery out of hope, admiration out of achievement, or both. And there was no demand from above. Contrary to Badian's theory, Alexander did not enlist the oracle of his father Ammon to impose himself on Greece at last as an Aesophios foes. Nor am I surprised that he did not. Even on Badian's theory, he had seen his father try to do so, only to be murdered before his very eyes. What though about those who succeeded Alexander? Sonship of a god was not quietly abandoned as an embarrassing bit of conceit. Seleucus I certainly claimed to be the begotten son of Apollo, as we see best from the hymn text from Erythri, vainly evaded by Yosif in a recent attempt to deny such claims for Seleucus I. Like Alexander's sonship, it was validated by an oracle, the oracle of Didyma, where Seleucus showed such generosity, and Demodemus, the Milesian, was his local link. No rival successor is known to have made fun of this claim, and Seleucus's heirs still proudly evoke it. Though it is surprising that Ptolemy, though officially enthroned as pharaoh of Egypt by 304, never developed his pharaonic title into an Alexander-like claim to be begotten son of Zeus. As for divine honours, again, the honours for the early successors correspond, I insist, exactly to the dynamic behind Alexander's. They never decree them. They receive them from below as spontaneous or tactical honours voted by the cities in their ambiance. We see this not only, of course, at Athens, liberated in 307, but also explicitly on Rhodes, when saved by Ptolemy. The Rhodians even consult Siwa about whether to honour Ptolemy as a god. And the best case of all, in 303, Sicyon grants godlike honours, Isothii Timai, to Demetrius as their city's re-founder. On Delos, or on Samos, or even a little skepsis, I assume the same dynamic applied. Lastly, where I began, the difficult question, belief. Scholars now embrace the paradox in these cults of living mortals, and write about divinité mortelle, or honest hypocrisy, or even more complicated structural phrases, inventing new terms for our good old double think. I demur, however, when they minimise flattery, saying that it is an intellectualist interpretation, fit only for a few over-educated members of an elite. Why be so patronising? by the intelligence of the demos in many Greek cities. The Athenian demos heard the open pleas for flattery of Alexander from their orators and were perfectly able to construe what they were doing in those materialist terms. But what of the rulers? Did any of them, Alexander included, really think they were a god? This is not an impossible Christianizing question. For Alexander, we do have evidence, both from his actions and also from the writings of contemporaries. In 326, in northwestern India, the contemporary Aristobulus describes that the prize wrestler Diaxippus 
saw blood flowing from Alexander's leg wound and obsequiously hailed it as, I quote, I call such as flows in the immortal gods. Nonsense, Alexander replied, it's blood. <laughs> this exchange is not, despite Jacobi and others, impossibly confused in our tradition. Plutarch gives it and then twice later simply compresses it, giving Alexander's first and the question which he rebutted second tacked on to the answer. It's only in order to shorten the same exchange. True, sources as late as Seneca ascribe the flattery quite wrongly to philosophers with Alexander. They're doing so only as part of internal philosophy wars to discredit people like Anaxarchus. Presumably, the exchange is given for us by Aristobulus so as to answer critics of Alexander who claimed he thought of himself as a full-blown immortal. But importantly, the same Aristobulus didn't simply deny Alexander's claims to divine honours altogether. Notoriously, according to him, Alexander is said to have said in 324-3 that he would, I quote, consider himself not unworthy, Arian, or suppose himself fit, Strabo, to be the third god of the Arabians if he conquered them and gave them back their ancestral autonomy. This is certainly not, despite Brunt, an explicit demand for a cult of himself. It is a remark, almost more of a quip, as to what success will bring. Yet for Alexander, nonetheless, the conquest and liberation of Arabia were not lesser deeds than the deeds of a god like Dionysus in India. In the same 324, Alexander still consulted and obeyed an oracle, Amens, about whether to honour Hephaestion as a god. If he thought of himself as a god, why would he have bothered to ask another god what to do, and then do what it said, contrary to what he himself had wished in the first place? Why is he represented as assiduously sacrificing every day to the gods in his last week in Babylon, in the royal diaries? We are not Christianizing if we assume the obvious beliefs behind such actions and external movement. Only Ephippus complicates the picture, alleging that Alexander at the end of his life liked to dress as gods and goddesses. That work, though, is revealingly entitled, On the Death of Ephesian and Alexander, patently a hostile pamphlet by what Tarn well described, I quote, as a scurrilous pasquinada. Alexander wears a lion helmet like Heracles on the Alexander sarcophagus. He may at times have worn a ram's horn, the attribute of Father Amen, as on that questionable gold coin. Ephippus may simply have exaggerated what could be seen. For instance, Jane Connolly suggested that Alexander perhaps dressed in divine looking robes when officiating for the gods, like other Greek priests, she suggests, and priestesses in the Greek world. Or for Sporforth, the dress which he wore when going lamb hunting was being willfully misrepresented by Ephippus. Melissa's invention, I think, is at work, just as Octavian was accused by Antony of dressing like Apollo at a dinner party in 40 BC. For Alexander and those around him, the crucial phase of ever would be honours equal to those of the gods. Isothei timai, that endless phrase in our evidence. Isothios was not full Theos, as Hepting first stated, and as incidentally an inscription from Chime, recent one, uh, I Chime 17, makes quite clear. It refers to Isothioi Kai Theoi as distinct categories. Alexander did not think he had changed somehow into an immortal. What are the successors? Perhaps the theatrical Demetrius, the Michael Heseltine of the successor age, came close to thinking at times he was really rather divine. <laughs> However, according to the hostile Athenian Democrates, even Demetrius thought that the Athenian cults of his adored two tarts, Leina and Lamia as Aphrodite, were a step too far. On the other end of the open isothial scale, as old Seleucus say, or surely Antigonus Gonatas. The recent evidence that Antigonus received divine honours must not obscure two facts about them. They fall only at the very end of his very long life. They've been given only in an attic Eubean orbit, where Antigonus's actions just saved the coast from pirates, a typically divine rescue act, 
in the eyes of grateful subjects, whatever he himself did or did not think of such honours. Of course, Alexander liked especially to hear he was receiving godlike honours, and hence they were deployed as a means to an end. My point is simply Alexander was not wholly original or idiosyncratic in relation to the gods. He was, however, transformative for those who came after him. What had been done by cities for Alexander, because of his extraordinary prowess, became the benchmark of honour for those who claimed to succeed him. Cities could not do less for them if they wished to please them than they had done exceptionally for Alexander before. To conclude, we have only one underappreciated ancient account of how group real account began. Its author is an unknown Jew, writing our wisdom of Solomon in Greek in, I would argue, the mid-first century. It was a bereaved father, he claims, who first put up an image to the memory of his dead young son, and then imposed rites and mysteries on others under his authority. He set a trend, and in turn, the author suggests, the trend passed to the royal family. But sometimes the rulers were far away. At those times, they couldn't be honoured in person, he concludes, so people devised images of them in, I quote, their zeal to flatter the absent as if it was present. And then finally, the author tells us, a master artist made one such image, perhaps he even suggests, because he wished to flatter someone in authority. It was such a beautiful image that the masses were charmed by it, and I quote, accounted as an object of devotion him who was formerly a man. This excellent rationalizing etiology draws on language and ideas which were widely current in the surrounding Greek world, making the absent present, a famous Athenian hymn for Demetrius, flattery as ever, not just in the mind of intellectuals, and above all, the role of beauty, especially beauty in art, just as the little polis of skepsis, I quote, was to set up as beautiful a cult statue as possible for Antigonus. One-eyed, it was difficult. But the Jewish author was wrong. For Angeles Caniotis, too, in 2007, I quote, in order to understand the, he the historical significance of Hellenistic ruler cult, one should exclude the cult of Alexander from the discussion. His exceptional achievements and his personal idiosyncrasies confuse the general picture. But in fact, when understood, he clarifies it. The cults for the early successors are explicable simply by the widespread cults which endured for Alexander. Without that precedent, based on his unique prowess, would there ever have been so many Esothii Timai across the next 700 years? Some sacrifices here, perhaps, some wine flicking there, and maybe a Hetaira or two as Aphrodite, but in general, my point is, no. <laughs>